Copyright, University of Auckland, all rights reserved. I was really good to talk, but I, um, when you mentioned how our prison population has, has increased since, you said in the last 20 years, I think, um, have you read kind of this book? Yes. Yes, um, and, and well, you, you know that it mentions how the US has a similar situation and it identifies it as because of the drug war. Do you think that's a similar situation? The, 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 the drug, we, I mean, we have very high uh, rates of um, incarceration around drugs. So it is very similar. I mean, a lot around the Jim Crow too, where you see, um, I think Wakon's very useful in that way as well, in looking at both sort of the, in his punishing the poor, so that we see particular ways that we punish the poor, both in the welfare state, you know, in terms of workfare, and in terms of the criminal justice system. So yeah, you do get what, what could be called a perfect storm. I mean, one of the things I think around in the US, I remember, um, been at a, a conference where um, William Chambliss was speaking, and he was talking about the real, the really significant increase in incarceration of women, uh, of black women. And people asked, "Well, why do you think that is?" And the first thing he responded immediately was, "They're running out of black men." Um, and then he sort of stepped back and he said, "Well, I say that lightheartedly, but there is some truth to it." Now, largely, of course, that really large increase of women going into the American prison system has nearly all been in terms of the war of drugs, particularly very early on. But it's the churn that you get as well. So overwhelmingly, both for our men and women, um, drug charges are one of the most significant ways. And I, I did say there I wasn't going to talk about decriminalisation, but um, it's, I think that to, to get a justice system where you reduce social harm, you do have to talk about decriminalisation as a part of that discussion. Any other questions? particularly in the youth sector. I think in the New Zealand system there are some differences there. There are actually three prisons at the moment that are seen as model prisons that are uh, supposed to be, every prisoner in those prisons is supposed to be engaged in meaningful either work, skills training, um, or other forms of education. So there are three model prisons in place. I actually spend a lot of time at one. I see very little evidence of any of that. Um, I've asked the women a lot about this in terms of you know, the working in ones. One of the worst things around, you know, the absolute characteristic, um, dominant characteristics of prisons is how boring they are. You know, absolutely, overwhelmingly, it's boring. It's just boring. There's nothing going on. <laughs> it's boring. So that, that makes them volatile places. So for a lot of them, they certainly want, they want meaningful skill development meaningful work. I have had one woman who said it was the only time that she actually did have employment was when she was in prison working in the kitchen. She's since been released and not been able to find any work at all. Um, so there is that issue. There is the issue that, I, that you're alluding to is around exploitation and around having a captured labour market. Um, there's a prison in the southwest of France at the moment uh, that is really standing out in this area. So it's, it's a high security prison. Um, it has, those that are in it are people that are in for serious offending and it has been trialling very successfully, it's not even really trialling now, it's just put it into place, a full working prison where the prisoners are paid minimum wage. Um, they're paid minimum wage, some of their earnings goes towards victims if that is appropriate and that there are victims in place and the rest of it goes into savings for, for them to use on release. And one of the really amazing things around this prison and uh, it's one that I'm hoping to actually visit, is that a lot of the work now is done with minimal to no supervision. So it has been seen, it's seen, I mean it's only, I think it's only three or four years in, so it's still, and it's a high risk endeavour. When I say high risk, high risk politically, it's a high risk endeavour. Um, and so you've got to be quite courageous politically to do that. But that, that prison is, is stands out at the moment of where they're actually 
putting that into place. So you could have high skill, high labour, it doesn't necessarily have to be exploitative. Now, how will it work out in practice in New Zealand? At the moment you get about, uh, those who know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it can be around between 50 cents an hour um, and, and up, to, up to 250. Most of the women I know work in the prisons at the moment is seen as a privilege. So if you have charges or have other, or your um, classification, your security classification is too high, you actually can't work in the prison. So I spend most of my time in the high security wings. There's only only have um, cell cleaners. There's no work in the high security. So this prison that I'm talking about in the southwest of France is, is a high security where it's actually seeing that work. So that would be a model that I would like to see replicated. But I think the high, I think there is a real opportunity. I actually think it's a human rights issue, given that 13 percent of, uh, given that 100 percent of the women that I see have been excluded from the compulsory education system at uh, a young age, their right to an education has been denied. Uh, one of the things that I think that a prison could do, and you know, I'm in a, is I'd, I think that we can do nearly all of those things outside of the prison. There's about what, 3 to 10 per cent of people that would be unsafe in the community. But those others we could work outside of the community, and I think that would be uh, a better way of doing it. But I don't think there's the political appetite for that yet. Any other questions? Um, just to go back to that that promise of um, to putting the work in the prisons, I actually find that how do you explain that it's even being built for in a negative context? Uh -huh. I'm thinking about Russia and China. Where yeah. It's any, any kind of thing that might benefit a prisoner is off the table because why should they get anything for free? Well, there, there has been that discussion. I mean, it's around the health one. I mean, in the US prison system, and you have prisons now because the American system, you locked them up for such a long time, you've got the palliative care prisons. You know, we think of prisons as always being young, but they're aging because you, know, you get 50 years, you get 60 years, you get things, you've got aging prisons. So there is the thing around the, why should they get the, a higher level of health care than those on the outside. The um, thing is, you are guardians of the state, the state has responsibilities in terms, in terms of that. But my big thing is what work are they going to do? I see very, you know, there's going to be have to be a complete cultural shift within the prisons to really be able to meet, to get anywhere near that. As I said, I'm in one of the model prisons. I've seen very little evidence of that in the last. It's been a model prison for two years in terms of the skill training, work, and education. Yeah, you know, those things are not those things are not occurring. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done on the ground in terms of promoting um, things around ensuring that we really focus around social harm. So there's a lot that can be done in that area. I mean, you know, our prison population still is quite young, you know, really young. Those 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds, you know, some of them come in as children. Um, what could have been done for them two years before, three years before? We have this incredible propensity here to lament the very young child victim, and yet by the time they're a teenager, to see them as predatory and other ways. You know, so there's huge that amount that can be done in terms of attitudinal change. Um, there is work that can be done in the volunteer sector, but I have to say that it is relatively limited now. I think that the pr that prisons often say they're consolidating in that area, which means that they're stopping a lot of those programs. Um, there's, you know, it, it does require both political and social engagement, um, and it does require, you know, Angela Davis always says that the prisons become invisible to us. You know, they're absolutely a central piece of our social landscape. We can't imagine a society without them, and yet we forget about them and the people that are in them. 
you know, just largely forget about them. I think there can be done a lot that can be done, particularly, as I said, at the poverty alleviation. That is not going to be the total story, but it's a very significant part of it. So it is around being engaged, being active in your community, finding out about what happens. Um, I was just talking to some people the other day, and they had done a, a survey. Um, it was actually Variety, uh, the children's charity. And you know, they've done, they do a lot of good work, and they, they particularly try to work to individual needs of children. And they've been wondering whether they're, you know, again, because of the, the bigger emphasis around child poverty, they're wondering if their sorts of interventions actually will have the biggest effect. So they've done a little bit of research on it. And one of the things they did, which was just a whole lot of focus groups in South Auckland uh, and in West Auckland, asking children if they could have anything, what would they have? And their expectation was that they'd be largely consumer items, you know, that they'd be Xboxes and other things. And the overwhelming <coughs> response was a bed. They wanted to have their own bed. And the woman who told me this said that she couldn't believe it. She'd done the research. She said she never, ever imagined that that's what they would ask for. Because she never really imagined that children didn't have their own beers, but that was overwhelmingly the dominant response. So there's a lot of work that can be done. You know, that mitigating of, of social harm and, and trying to change the conversation, which is not to diminish those that are the victims of crime, but it's to try to ensure that people don't become victims. This is the thing around the social harm um, focus is that it is something that's trying to engage with, with issues b before you create victims. We largely have a system that responds to the effects of victimisation, but it responds to them very selectively. but it is something that you actually can be engaged in, you can do things, you can make a difference. You know, if you work towards trans with transformative intent, transformation can occur. There is that real sense that we just live in this society as we can critique them, there's nothing you can do to change it. You can be agents of change. Uh, you know, and there are some types of forms of change that we never really can imagine that can come through. Some it's going to be for the long haul. But we, you know, we have seen societal changes in our own lives. Many of us have seen, you know, I can remember because of the age that I am, things that occurred that I never thought would happen. You know, I can remember where I am, where I was when, when, when certain things. You know, when the Berlin waters came down, how did that happen? It happened through societal change. It happened through a whole range of things, both at macro, micro, uh, at the micro level. You know, I knew people who were um, in the struggle in South Africa. And I'd asked them in 1993, so two years, I, I said to them, did you s think that you would see the dismantling of apartheid in your lifetime? These people who were active, these people who had been incarcerated, these people who had been exiled, they'd been tortured. And I said, did you ever think, think that you would see it in your lifetime? And not one of them said they thought they'd see it in their lifetime, but they believed that their children or their grandchildren would. Change, significant social change can happen. And, and it happens through that, that, that type of level of engagement. So there is nothing beyond our reach. What we have created, we can uncreate, and we can create new things. Kia ora koutou.